Hello everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve at jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Jazz Transcription Clinic podcast. Uh, today's guest doctor is uh, a good friend of mine uh, and I'm so happy to have this guy here today because we, uh, we have to go back in history quite a lot given that I'm 277 years old. We are talking about at least two centuries ago where the young, he was already young back then. <laughs> uh, he, uh, I don't know the reasons, maybe I will ask you, but um, he started following me and asking a lot of questions. Uh, most of the times related to music, some other times related to life in general. And uh, I was smart enough to not provide any specific suggestion for life, maybe for music a couple. And then one day he presented himself at my place in, in Florence uh, and put in front of me a sheet of music. And I said, what is that? And he said, is it transcription that I made? Oh, cool. Who's that? Who's the artist? And he said, it's you. And that day, uh, we stopped our friendship for, for almost ever. No, I'm kidding. But uh, I think this guy here is the only one who has ever transcribed one of my solos. And luckily enough, he stopped after the first one. <laughs> so nobody else has ever tried or dared to try it. Uh, so, guest doctor for today is the one and only Giulio Cadmassi, and Giulio is an extraordinary musician, an extraordinary artist. Uh, he lives in Los Angeles uh, since 2003 uh, now, and he's uh, very, very active as a musician, as a composer. His uh, main activity at the moment is to write for the film industry, and he can probably talk and explain a little bit. Uh, it would be interesting to, to see and to know whether uh, transcribing is of any help for someone who is writing music for, for films. But beside this activity, um, uh, extraordinary qualities of Giulio has brought him to uh, get several degrees, like a piano degree, a degree for um, sound engineer, and a degree in film scoring, and but as well as a very, very prolific live activity that has uh, seen him performing with La Creme de la Creme of the world jazz, uh, with artists uh, such as Steve Gadd, Will Lee, Pat Metheny, Chris Potter, Antonio Sanchez, and many, many, many others that maybe Julio will like to share with us. So thanks a lot, Julio. It's really a privilege and a pleasure, of course, to have you here. I feel a little bit more back at home. It's a bit weird to talk in English to you because usually we like to talk in, in a really deep and dirty Tuscan accent. But um, today, you know, for the sake it's, it's of... It's like we have, to, we have to play with a MIDI instrument that doesn't bend the notes, like uh, the same solo, but we're just doing it with like, like quantized in English. Or it doesn't vibrate, you know, the way you want. <laughs> you, well, you, now, you now try, you're offering other metaphors now. You can try to, <laughs> to shake the keyboard, but usually it doesn't uh, make any sense. Thank you for having me. No, it's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure. And uh, so, do you want to add anything to 
my poor presentation? Uh, the, the only thing I would add is that when I met you, I, I met you at the time when you were in a quartet, uh, which I don't believe has ever recorded a record. It was with Stefano Battaglia, Palino della Porta, and uh, Paolo Corsi, perhaps? I, there I was, uh, at the beginning, there was uh, Roberto Gatto. Oh, okay. Playing okay. with us. And then I think Roberto... From the trio, I guess, because Stefano had the yeah. trio with Roberto and Paulino. So for, for all the listeners, uh, Stefano Battaglia is a great jazz Italian pianist who has recorded uh, many albums with ECM uh, records and also the, the Splash label in Italy. And I was a student of him and then he asked me to join his uh, quartet, his band. Uh, and, I, but, and I don't remember how I heard you guys the first time. I don't remember what the the thing was. Maybe it was Siena Jazz that you guys did a gig there when uh, when uh, Stefano was teaching. I don't know what happened, but I remember the time. I must have been like 16 probably because that's when the, I started orbiting around the Siena Jazz world. And, uh, I, you know, it, it was... Uh, I come from a relatively small town, from a non non music loving family. There was no jazz in my family, and any music uh, like uh, written past uh, eighteen hundred was considered like blasphemy and like uh, you know and the equivalent of sex, drug, and rock and roll. Uh, even if it was like Ravel was like too risque, and uh, and so. I, I was like all of a sudden shifting to this new world where the sounds and notes and chords were beautiful and like I didn't know they existed. It was literally this uh, coming into like uh, a, a new form of awareness of the world could be good musically and 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 and, and expanded and wide and median and uh, you know and uh, and I just remembered the experience of hearing you guys. Uh, and uh, and it was this sort of like coming home thing where all of a sudden it was like oh oh this makes sense this this is uh, I, I I can turn off my brain and just like set like feel this in as as if it was some version of something I had thought and now my thoughts were being played back to me by these gentlemen on stage. Yeah, and I, I think there is a common trait here that I can see has also Stefano Battaglia comes from classical music and classical music has been my background as well. So uh, we were probably a bunch of musicians who translated from classical music into modern improvised music. And uh, it was harmonically incredibly rich. If you think about Stefano's songs, are always this sort of circle of harmony where there's like a crazy key change, a major third away that then goes back. But it sounds like it's it's flowy. It, it doesn't sound forced in any way. But when you go, I remember when Stefano gave me some charts for the first time. I was like, whoa! Like, uh, and 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 I guess even then, you know, especially at the time when I was still very new to the jazz language, uh, it must have been very. It just felt like alchemy and 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 like a shaman doing something. I, was like, I don't understand exactly what you guys are doing. I know it's beautiful. But I'm trying to enter this discourse that is uh, still a little murky. Like if when I go home and I try to do it, it doesn't quite come out this way. But I know it's right. I know you guys are right and I'm wrong. But I'm trying to understand what's the bridge that leads me there. And and you specifically had this, you know, I don't. I, it's hard to describe music in words because music has this capacity of being pre-verbal, of being. Uh, spiritual in a way and so almost when you describe it, it it loses what what it really is communicating but there's a transcendental quality to the capacity that, that i perceived from you when you were soloing but even when you were playing a long note you know you can tell a story by playing a long note and inflecting the pitch and inflecting the tone in a certain way or playing that note 
20 millisecond later behind a beat or ahead of the beat. Every decision is a story, but you can tell a musician general direction within the first three, four seconds of when they grab an instrument. It's like, oh, I get it. Like you're seeking that thing. And whatever it is that you were seeking, it it spoke to me in um like you were you were uh, answering a question I had in my mind. Like you were giving me a solution. You were uh, um telling me like, look, come here. Like, there's a door here that leads outside where the sun is. And, and so I was immediately sort of like, you know, like a, like a spirited animal in the, in the, in the woods with you playing the, the, the flute. And I, I was like, oh, I'll follow. I like, whatever you say, I want to know where you're going. Yeah. And, and, and the other beautiful thing is that you guys really, I mean, you know, uh, I'm sure I was impressed with that, but I mean, you know, I, I had still like several, I already played five instruments by the time I met you guys. I already, you know, was a fairly cl like classically proficient musician. I, I wasn't like my first year or anything, but you guys had a capacity also of really blending together really well. There, there didn't seem to be, sometimes you can put the best musicians in the world in the same room and they just happen not to want to go to the same door and so individually they're incredible this sounds amazing and it's incredibly boring you guys didn't have that you guys felt really like committed to the same discovery um and you were all very sensitive romantic musician i guess at heart there was yeah. a sense of uh of everybody was looking for that like unspeakable place it didn't feel like oh let me show you what i can do there there was never a sense of like cleverness not as in it was dumb but in a sense of like <laughs> nobody was trying to show off that like haha you didn't think i was gonna go there yeah. it felt very like just honest honest yeah. and beautiful and just direct yeah uh thank you thank you but let's let's go back to you which is <laughs> Uh, at this time more important. Um, one thing I forgot to mention in the introduction is that Giulio is a multi-instrumentalist. And when I say multi-instrumentalist, <laughs> I really mean it. So usually I introduce myself if I send a CV out, I define myself a multi-instrumentalist. But if I compare uh, to Giulio, I'm just a beginner, a first year student, because Giulio, you have to guys, check him out because he can really play basically everything. And now I, I would like to dive a little bit into the topic, of course, of the podcast, which is uh, transcribing and, and the art of transcription, because I think is related to uh, your specific ability to take something in your hands that can produce a sound and make some music out of it, which is a, a, a quite rare gift that few people have. You know, I can. I'm also self-taught, so like I, I also yeah. like my approach to every instrument has always been uh, uh, to sort of touch them until they made us, until they reacted in some way. As we were just like talking about last week, how to this day I'm like, oh, there's that B flag. <laughs> yeah. How, how, how nice. <laughs> Yeah, and, and make me very upset and jealous and feel that uh, it, it's too unfair, you know, that you, you can play the saxophone with a gorgeous sound and you don't see yourself as a saxophone player. <laughs> you know? I don't see myself as a performer, even in, in, in some bizarre way I, I don't think of it as that I'm just like I'm trying to listen to good music and the quickest way sometimes to do it is to overdub myself and to be proficient enough to be able to create certain textures but that's always the goal it, is that I need to hear that so I like I, I come up with an idea in my head and I since I was a child I was like damn it I need to do this long note I just heard this ECM record and I need to take a tenor and a trumpet and octave, put some reverb and do this long note that is always the same and the chords change underneath. And 
the the only way, the quickest way to find that solution in Pisa in like 1995 with not a single musician among my friends was like just grab the damn saxophone you figure it out yeah yeah which is you know also it it could be seen as an arrogant act right you you listen to i don't know uh john simon playing barry saxophone and you say yeah i want to do it and everyone yeah, else I, I, could I, go, I, I assume it I assume it is. I mean, think about the fact of, of me even thinking about being the thing is multi instrumentalist. I mean, I don't know the, what could be more arrogant. I mean, what could be more uh, uh, daring, I guess, as a, as a multi instrumentalist? I'd be like, oh, yeah, I, I could. Uh, and I was air playing instruments before I knew how to play them to Pat's records when I was 12, like, and I would think like, oh yeah, and then I would do that, and then I would, da, 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 da. and, you know, and at the time, uh, even the thought that I, that, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, but the thing is, uh, I was uh, uh, cursed by the fact that it was easy, because I started improvising on the piano within a month or two that I didn't know how to read music. I, I learned how to play the piano before knowing how to read the music, basically. And uh, I didn't know any technique of trumpets, actually, but I would just sort of take them and something would happen. And uh, I would have like a little four, four track cassette recorders and I would play. And to my ears uh, as a 13 year old or something, it sounded good enough. And so it just sort of seemed like, yeah, of course. I, it was more like, why doesn't anybody, everybody do this? Like, this is so nice and fun. Like, obviously you should be doing this. Why would you just play one instrument? That's insane. So obviously you had a very sad childhood <laughs> <laughs> and lonely, right? Actually, fun fact that I spent the like my entire elementary school in a hospital bed with like IVs, uh, like a blood disease because wow. my blood wouldn't coagulate so i didn't really go to elementary school much because i i they were trying they didn't know what was happening but basically i was constantly almost dying and then they would give me this like big transfusions of stuff to keep me alive and then at one point you know i went to every doctor in italy and every five seconds i became like in all the different corners of italy tried to find the, the new expert uh, and nobody knew what to do, or they would do something and it would like last for like a month and then it would go down again. And then finally I took my splint away when I was like 10 or so. And and since then I've been all right. But that that was uh, that was sort of like my preparation to get into music in a way. And I, and I think it was very fundamental also in this sense of like, oh yeah, I can overcome that. Like, like it's fine. Like, yeah, it's hard, but it's no big deal. I'll figure it out. So this is my mistake. You know, I went to elementary schools, <laughs> to, to primary think, schools, and then... And get this, I dropped out of school when I was 14. So I effectively only done truly middle school in my entire life. So another, I don't have mis a high another mistake on my account. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have the, the conservatory diploma as a pianist, but I don't have a, an actual normal con high school diploma. Yeah. It doesn't seem that it had a bad impact on you <laughs> no, I, at all. I think I was much better for it. So, Julio, there is one question that I always ask to my guests uh, in this podcast, and is why do you transcribe? Um, there are, uh, the, my main focus in transcription throughout my life has been harmony and voicings, uh, more than, than, than single lines. The single lines have also been part of it, but the, the, the more interesting quests I've done have been, I remember one of the first things I did, there was this beautiful co concert of Michel Petrucciani at the Champs Elysees, um, it's a double concert that he does a piano solo. I, Petrucciani is, is one of the, 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 the musicians I probably saw live the most, other than, well, Pat now for, for work reasons. Uh, but uh, I, I just I, I couldn't get enough. And he had, to my, to my years, the, when, I was, when I was really young, this really like 
tight chords, these clusters, these like five, six parts harmony where almost all the notes of the chords are played. And it's this beautiful, crunchy sound. And, um, and I, I just couldn't figure it out. And I remember one of my first quests was like, I need to know. And, and honestly, I think a lot of the voicings I use to this day derive from me trying to get to what he was doing. I, I don't think I I don't think I've ever heard something that quite topped that until I I find out uh, about Klaus Ogerman. Are you familiar with Klaus Ogerman, the yep. Avenger? Sure. Um, he he started like uh, one of his biggest achievements originally was to like work with Jobim and work uh, on, on his records uh, and then Sinatra, but then he worked with Barbara Streisand and did yeah. a lot of that. But he also had his own career where he was going a little more uh, uh, polychords and, and horizontal harmony where he will do these things where there's just six voices going on at the same time and a bass line. And the concept of chords starts shifting more into this horizontal thing of ritardandos and uh, and uh, and, uh, and apoggiaturas, uh, and uh, that would be uh, probably my the, the pinnacle of like what I what I try to get. He does this thing often where he has a minor second uh, at the top voice of an orchestration, and. and to my brain, it was like, wait, no, you can't do that. And, 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 but you can, and it's incredible. And uh, he, he, he always puts his minor seconds as the most like uncomfortable place and they work and they're beautiful. And, and, and another actually agent that, that brought me there was, uh, uh, I want to say, I want to say it was Pier Annunzi. I think uh, during a class of Siena Jazz, uh, he started talking about the concept of never repeating the same note in a, in a two hand chord on the piano. So like to kind of see, okay, well, you already played this note on the left hand, so you shouldn't play on the right hand as well. Uh, and that also is, is, is to this day being like the thing I think of every time that I put my hands down like uh, the piano or, or I try to harmonize something it's like to never do octaves of anything or double, unless it's a melody. I, it always seems that what I'm looking for is to always have one more note of the scale. And as many of the notes of the scale, as wide as I can, seem to always get to this like magical horizontal place. Anyway, in terms of transcription, so one, th one thing was, was the voicings on the piano. The other thing is that when I started uh, doing YouTube videos, which um, I, I guess around 2007, uh, uh, my mom told me, uh, I, I, had done some, I had done some small videos of me playing bass and piano and drums for the first time. I, it was not something I had ever done and cameras were sort of still not, you know, YouTube wasn't a thing back then. It was still sort of like a nerdy thing. Nobody looked at. And my mom told me like, wow, I could really realize that you can play all those instruments. When I listen to you recording, I don't think about it that way. It just sounds like a record. But now that I can see it, it's like, it just grabs my attention. I was like, even my mom doesn't understand that I play like 10 instruments. And that led me to like, what if I tried to do something else? And, and so I, I, I did Spain and then, and then at one point, uh, uh, anyway, um, s s someone told me to like, um, I had some conversation with someone that was working with Madonna at the time, some big shot manager. And he was one of the many infinite people that told me to give up something. Like I've been told to give up playing saxophone and trumpet because you cannot have a double embrasure. They, I've been told to not sing because I didn't have a good voice. I've been told I, every, every time along the way, you can be a multi-instrumentalist. Why don't you just focus on piano? You can't, why are you moving to America? Why are you doing this? Why? It was just that every, every Everywhere I look, everybody for the past 25 years has told me I shouldn't do or I couldn't do something. But in this case, it must have pissed me off enough because I decided to do a couple of show off videos and I, three videos. I came out, I'm going to do three. I'm going to do Bohemian Rhapsody where I sing all the parts, which took time. And then uh, I'm going to do a Muse song uh, where I play guitar. I didn't play guitar whatsoever. So I had to kind of like, as a bass player, learn uh, this part that was particularly difficult and singing. And I wasn't a singer. I still am not. 
Uh, but, uh, and then I decided I would do a Breaker Brothers song. And I was like, what can I do? Like, what's a song that is just like, F, F you song for a, and I, was, and I, and there was this, this song from Back to, uh, Back to, Back to Back? Maybe back to back, I think this is called the album. Uh, uh, that is called uh, Slick Stuff. Um, and I was like, I'm just going to do this. I don't know how long it's going to take me. I'm just going to learn this. And once I entered that place, I realized I had no clue how they were harmonizing. Like, there's this alto trumpet and saxophone doing all this, all these like very staccato, very quick arpeggios. But the sound didn't sound like my. I, I was just like, I don't know what this is. This does not sound like something that my brain registered. It was like, oh, I try it. Or, oh, yeah, it's like a sixth. Uh, I, and I, at the time, thanks to technology, I took the, the song in Pro Tools. I slowed it down three or four times. And then I looped like the same chord. It was like, pa, 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 and kept trying different voicings until I realized that they were doing essentially a fourth with like a, a, a minor second at the bottom. So let's like say like D, E flat and G, like that kind of position. For, that would be sort of like a, a minor nine chord on the right hand type of vibe. And they were just doing the entire melody harmonized that way. So every bit the, the, the alto would be always sandwiched in the middle, the tenor would be at the bottom and Randy would be doing the high note. And they would do a full melody, all of that one shape. And of course, after I realized that the first three were their way, I was like, oh, okay, I, I see what they're doing. It's like a, it's like an effect, it's like a pedal before there were pedals in, in, in some way. And in fact, if you think about it, uh, uh, Mike Breaker kept that sort of idea later on in Steps Ahead, used a lot of the harmonization where he would have one harmony and he would solo with the harmony throughout. Yeah. And I guess it came probably from all that time in the Breaker Brothers doing that in real time with real players. And the other funny thing is that in that case, uh, uh, Will was playing bass on that track. I, this was like a decade before I met Will. But uh, but he knew me before I met him through that video. In any case, uh, so the transcription has come in handy for when I when I've been trying to copy others uh, for the videos uh, because for many years uh, I it, it, that would definitely was the quest. It's like there's all these beautiful things I've heard in my life, and I would like to have the experience of doing them. It feels good to hear Night Spry by Shikaria and do it. And then when I done it and I listen to myself do it, it feels like I won over death. I can fly. I can do this other thing that I couldn't do before. And there's no way to do that without, I mean, I don't know, there might be some geniuses that don't need to transcribe that and sit down and figure out what they're doing, but it, it just requires the time to like yeah. push in your brain things that your brain doesn't normally do. Yeah. If now I heard a thing that sounds like the Breaker Brothers, my brain might not need to transcribe it because I'm now trained to like, oh yeah, that's the sound. I know what that sound is. But at the time, I have no clue. Mm. And so every time there's something new, I don't know what it is. That's the time to go back. And do you have a, a specific methodology that you use, like a, a sort of routine that you apply? For example, I like, if I have the time, if I don't want to like transcribe a solo from start to end and I have, I don't know, two hours to dedicate. Right. But if I'm free, it's a, it's a long-term project. What I like to do is like to copy uh, one chorus of the solo like 10 times. And that's one track. And then what I do you copy... Mean copy 10 times? I, like... I use, for example, Logic or any other software yeah to edit, I cut the uh -huh. first chorus and I copy and paste 10 keep times. Keep listening, to the, keep looping the same yeah. chorus. So, and then I put it in my phone and I keep listening to that chorus like 10 times in a row and I start singing along. So it requires few days, but you know, after a few days I get the first chorus and another few days I get the second chorus and let's say like in three weeks, four weeks, I get the full solo, right? And I can sing it. So before I even right. try to play it, I just memorize it. 
Interesting. And that sounds really beautiful to like really like internalize them. Yeah, because uh, okay, this is the real topic of of, of uh, this podcast. But everyone has his own methodology, you know, and all the past guests have already demonstrated that you can do it however you like it. Mm -hmm. uh, my methodology comes from the teaching that Dave Liebman uh, taught me. You know, you have to first be able to sing it. Mm. So I started singing lines, singing phrases, and, and then I understood that actually uh, the concept is that when you sing it, it means that the sound has gone through your head and has, you know, deposited there, somewhere, is stored in your head. Mm -hmm. And so if you are able to recall the sound because you, you, you can sing it, so you, you are able to recall the sound of that line, then to play it is quick. It's very right, quick. Right. And also, there is another advantage that pays back the long time that it took me to memorize, that when I go to play I already know all the nuances and inflections that are made right. that are making that musician unique. You know, because if I'm learning Sonny Rollins, of course, I would articulate in a different way if I'm instead, I don't know, working on uh, Jan Garberic, for example. For sure. So those things that doesn't come on on a, on a paper and are so difficult if not impossible to write down it's better to memorize and once you have it i know exactly the sound of that note that you know sonny rollins plays on tenor madness right. uh, or young garbrek on on prisma that i know it's one of your favorite tracks and i can try to recreate that sound on the horn because I already know the it, It's interesting. Well, there's there's two aspects to that. One is that, of course, because my focus a lot is on chords, it, it would be hard to sing the, the voicings. And so in that sense, it would be... Uh, but the other thing is that uh, I think most of the things that I end up wanting to transcribe are things I have already listened to hundreds of times. Like uh, it, or, or rather, it's it's uh, it takes me a while normally to decide that something has reached the place of like I must know exactly what this is, uh, and and to get by the time I, my brain has decided that I've listened to that song so many times that I could sing it before I start just kind of, but there may be a couple of things I'm like wait what is he doing that is that a chromatic scale is he doing like a semi-diminished and then a half a chromatic thing and what wait is it that uh um but uh it also though brings back uh, in in backwards another part of the transcription that i've always like been interested in which is and maybe we go back to the theme of arrogance but i like to transcribe uh, myself improvising with my voice like if i am seeking something that i can't quite like let's say that I, there's a piece and i'm like doing a solo i'm like eh, this is this is okay but it just doesn't feel that inspired like that's the instrument is is stopping me from doing what i would want to do i'm i'm doing what the instruments makes makes it easy to do but i'm not doing what i want to do which is not what the instruments is letting me do that's not arrogant unless you know you publish it on a book and you sell it as you know how to improvise <laughs> or the ultimate solos uh, as it, the, it, there are people on the web that are doing <laughs> that and <laughs> I don't know how they can fall asleep at night actually <laughs> but I, but I find it interesting they, it saved me. It, I, I, I've saved it in two ways. One thing is that it definitely brought new life to something I was trying to do on a track where I would just take the mic, sing something, nothing, just turn off my brain and just like, what would you, blah, 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 and then go back and relearn myself. Like, what did I do that? Oh, interesting. And I've learned things up to the, about 
instruments by like copying what I did with my voice. Yes. The things that I wouldn't normally do that like might be uncomfortable with the, with that particular instrument. It's like, oh, but that's so nice on that instrument. To me, you know, with, with the saxophone, for example, uh, one key point for me was to try to change my sound. I had phases in my life, right? Mm. And I still have, but you know, when you are young, you're a teenager, you tend to uh, idolatrize people. You know, you, you listen to a player and you say, oh gosh, I, I want to sound like him. And saxophone right? is truly a chameleon of sounds. Yeah. It lends itself so much. So I remember that uh, a common friend that we have, a wonderful drummer, Andrea Milani, uh -huh. he was my uh, private uh, vinyl pusher. You know, he was lending <laughs> me a lot of vinyls. Uh, and one day he told me, Mirko, you need to check this guy out. And he gave me a copy of Fish Out of Water by Chas Lloyd. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And I never heard Chas Lloyd before. So I put on this, this record and I hear this sound, which is not a sound that you would expect in a jazz album from a tenor saxophone. It was something different. It was a mixture of flute, a mixture of uh, traditional Indian instruments of some sort. And then I started, you know, experimenting. I, it didn't even came to my mind, oh, I should change mouthpiece, I should change read. It, it was clear to me that the sound is here, and right. it's also clear that you, you can never reach someone else's sound because of the you know, physical conformation. Your physical features are <clears throat> your sound. But I realized that by moving my upper teeth a lot forward on the mouthpiece, mm. I could reach that fluty sound on the top notes, on the palm notes. Now, probably it's, it's really cold, the instrument, but... So, just really like... You know, it's a post Coltranian guy, but it's, it's no more related. Charles Lloyd has his own story now, his own, you Absolutely. know, uh, sonic print. But realizing that was, was a revelation for me, was, wow, I can get close to that sound. I can get that color if I want. And that's the other key. You know, when students reply to me, oh, but, you know, I don't want to transcribe because I don't want to sound like someone else. And I say, no, that's wrong. It's not wanting to sound like someone else, but it's like being able to have that color. And maybe you don't like that color, so you will never use it, but you know how to do it. And when you transcribe, you also get a lot of the technical stuff. I remember mm -hmm. my first jazz teacher, Maurizio Gianmarco, uh, he told me, and <laughs> it's funny because last year uh, at the university here, at the Monash University here in Melbourne, uh, there was a workshop with uh, um, Brentford Marsalis, mm -hmm. and he told a very similar story. So Maurizio Gianmarco, my teacher, gave me a Lester Young solo to transcribe. I said, do it. And I do it. I didn't do too well. It was one of the first solos. And then there was the note D on the tenor. And my teacher went, no, that's not right. And I said, no, that's right. It's a... And I said, no, that's not right. Do you hear the sound? It's not right. I said, oh, come on, are you kidding me? I think he was pulling my leg, right? Uh -huh. and, and then in the end, he told me, listen, you know, you, Lester plays the second D 
opening the side keys. Yes, five. Ah. So the pitch might be the same, but the sound is not the same. And Brentford told the same story that he gives some students solos with the side D open, and he keeps telling them that is wrong until they discover themselves. So my teacher was a little bit nicer because he told me in the end. But then, you know, I started transcribing like Michael Brecke, and I realized oh, he does that, it on every note of that Michael Brecke was doing a combination of the two. So he was doing the traditional D fingering with the octave key and opening. And then adding. You know, to get that nasal honk sound that he sometimes like. Right? Which is completely different from. So you have three different Ds. But you, you never realize it if you keep reading music. You only realize it when you try to, oh, no, no, this is not the right sound. No, this is not how it does it. This is not, you know, and all the false fingering, etc., etc. So to me, transcription is always a journey into diving deep, deeper and deeper and deeper into uh, sound colors. For sure. I mean, in, in, in that sense, also, the transcription for me is, is, uh, is transcribing arrangements. It's like I, I spent years like looking into like what, what, what instrument combination was used by Vince Mendoza and like this or that other part. What are the violas doing? Why are they doing Are they divisi? Uh, what could, how could I change that? Could I mimic that with a synth? Like this, the sonic. I mean, as an arranger brain, to me, an engineer also, like the sound is is really ninety nine percent of why I listen yeah. to a record. Like the notes are cool, and uh, I would say it's the sound, then the harmony, and then last. Do I really care about the actual like, eh, the notes? And and even later about i when i do transcriptions of of uh, melodies anything that is horizontal i never even write the the, the value of the, of the note like mm -hmm. when if you see something i transcribe they're just dots yeah. on the pentagram <coughs> and then i know the solo but like i i don't like to look at divisions of notes i just i i will do a cluster this is a phrase the melodic <coughs> phrase then there's another cluster of black the dots, and there's another black. And then I'll, I'll figure it out, or I'll, I'll listen to what the record is doing. But I don't like the idea of thinking like, oh, those are two eights, and then there's like a, like a dotted no. That just, I, I, I never heard a single jazz record where any note sounds remotely like it's an actual quantized bell. I mean, it's everything is constantly slightly off, and that is what makes it good. And if anybody tried to, and that's why, yeah, you see somebody that transcribed in a more specific, like modern classical way. And it's like, oh no, I mean, yeah, I guess technically those are the notes, but absolutely not like that. That does not yeah. carry on. And would you mind, Julio, telling me a little bit, I'm interested in, in hearing from you. I never asked you, but I remember the first time I saw that video that you made when you play all the instruments on the Padmithini song. On the first circle one. Yes. yes. Uh, which, by the way, is one of my favorite, you know, Padmithini group songs for, you know, the, the rhythmic features, the fact that the melody has a lot to do with uh, my personal, you know, melodic taste. It really resonates a lot with me, always had. And when I saw that video, first I thought you were crazy and then I hated you because I, <laughs> I, I sincerely thought you were incredible. You were amazing, you know. Thank so you. tell me a little bit the story, and of course, tell us, you know, what the outcome in the end has been. <laughs> um, well, the, the way that the way that that thing started is that uh, I'll I'll do the quickest backstory. So, 
um, uh, first of all, I, I, I bought when I when I was eleven. I bought my first jazz record. My my piano teacher Vincenzo Magia up in Pisa um, uh, played for me. So, someone to watch over uh, me uh, on the piano one day after the first six months that I was like not studying a single note of classical music and hating it and like the testing that I had to play the piano. He played this thing, changed my life, got into jazz uh, and decided to go to the store, I think somewhere and and bought random records from the way they co the cover looked. Like there was no specific reasons. I just like, maybe somebody told me something but it was just very random. And one of the three records that I bought was Watercolors by, by Pat uh, that has this like beautiful ECM because ECM's covers are just amazing. And, uh, and I, and I saw that and I bought it. So it was very, I, I, as long as I've known jazz, I listened to Pat's music. So of course, and I saw the famous, uh, VHS that came out in the nineties where they're doing like, the, they often do this, the live, live but controlled live environment, uh, uh, where, where, where there's that maybe one of the most famous version of for circle, yeah. uh, uh, where the, you, you see Lyle, uh, live on camera doing the piano solo and it's just this this euphoric joyful moment of music and uh, I think I I still have the 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 VHS but I think so the road to you the VHS yeah possible yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of it is recorded actually in Italy, if I'm correct. I think a lot of yeah, the dates. It's, it's in Europe, mainly in Europe, yes. Uh, because I guess they did a, a, a vinyl CD that was recordings, and then they did the, the VHS, which is slightly different performances from the tour, which is what we did too. At the end of the tour, we went to like a black box theater and we redid the, 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 the program of the concert, the three hour, but on camera. And so it is live, but it isn't technically a date from the tour. It's at the end of 160 shows mm. that we just like got in the room and, and did that. But, um, so anyway, I've always known Pad, loved Pad, uh, listened to Third Circle. Uh, it never occurred to me to do it, uh, like because it seemed impossible, honestly, to do it, and because I really can't play the guitar for if my life depends on it. It's like everybody plays guitar but me. But I just like my hands are used to play bass, and when I see the little frets on the guitar, I just like I get claustrophobic and I can't think. But. Uh, one day I was already friends with Will Lee in New York and I was talking with Will Lee's wife and uh, uh, I told her that someone had written me on Facebook saying that he had heard that Pat was looking for a multi-instrumentalist and that I should like get in touch with Ted Perlin, his manager in, uh, in Boston. And I thought as a joke, it's like, yeah, I'm going to write to Pat. Come on, let's get, let's get real here. And... Um, and I said it as a joke to Will's wife, without knowing that Will's wife was uh, was best friend, a really good friend with Pat's wife. And so I got into the subway. I did the train from Manhattan to Brooklyn, going back home. I got out of the subway. My phone got reception again, and I found uh, uh, a link, a, a, a text from uh, from Sandrine that was like, "Oh, I'm gonna write to like Pat's wife and like let him let him know that you're amazing, that you guys should jam." I was like, "What?" And uh, even then, I thought like, "Yeah, fine. I mean, like, sure. Like, it's gonna be like, he's gonna be polite, and it's gonna be all it is." So I didn't think twice of it. I went to sleep and the morning after I woke up and there was an email from Sandrine again, forward me, forwarding me the email from Pat. It was like, oh my God, this guy is amazing. We should jam. And I remember just like throwing the blanket out of the bed and just... <laughs> but at, at, and, the, uh, at and the, the time I mean, you already had the video done. No, at this point I had not done the video for so oh. I had some I had the Breaker Brothers done, I had okay. a few of the other videos done that were sent to him, but I had not done the first circle. So then time passes. Finally, I am invited to his house, beautiful penthouse on Central Park, and you know, I'm trapped, basically shaking. And uh, 
uh, we we jam a little bit, I think, uh, or maybe we just talked that day. I don't remember like, if we jammed the first. We must have jammed a little bit, maybe. But uh, but he basically said, "Look, I, I you know, like uh, long story short, basically, normally the audition to get into the band is to play for circle. Like we got a guy in. Like if you can't do the first circle, then like you can probably do the rest of the stuff." And uh, and uh, so just do one of your videos of first circle like that that's fine right it's like yeah sure no biggie like absolutely <laughs> now so it was a commission time, from pat itself by the time he asked me or or suggested let's say i didn't know how to play an acoustic guitar like i could strum a c major now the song opens with this two minutes of very intricate legato things where you have to keep changing the the, the 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 fingering where like there's one finger on one string you have to replace it with other strings without like changing the sustain to access another finger and then do go back and keep doing this while a very intricate right hand and i didn't know where to begin it was like somebody asked me to play the violin and i was like okay i mean and uh, I, I had no idea where the notes were on the guitar. I couldn't read the charts on the guitar. I, you know, I knew the first four string as a bassist somewhat. Um, and so I, I asked a good friend of mine, uh, Paolo Schianchi, a wonderful classical guitar player from Padma, now lives in DC in, in the United States. Uh, if you could just give me a couple of primers of like wh where do i so what am i doing and he god bless his soul he uh, uh, did the fingering for me he, he's like a mega genius of the guitar and he looked at, at the chart because pat had released a song book of uh, of his song so there was a chart not of all the parts there was like but the beginning of the guitar was there there wasn't the counterpart of pianos but like the, 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 at least the guitar was there and so he fingered for me. I was like, okay. And he did it in like 25 minutes. It, it, it literally blew my mind. But he was like in a hotel room in New York. He was visiting for like a night. And he was underslept with a jet lag. And he sat on the on the on the bed in this little baby motel room. I was like, okay, yeah. And then ah. Oh. No, yeah, I would do that. Okay, then you would do that. Then you have to pass it. This okay. Maybe use the thumb and then like... Anyway, so I was left with that with a few numbers of the fingering and I went home and I spent 45 days, 10 hours a day with blood coming out of my fingertips doing a bar at a time. A bar for six hours. Next bar for six hours. Next bar for six hours. Go back from the top. Now do the four of them together for like two days. And uh, and somehow I got to the end of it and then did the video. Uh, and, and then I had to dress. The, other, the rest of the thing was like a no brainer compared to, the, to like <laughs> learning guitar. Yes, there's like all these odd bars. And yes, there's all these counterpoints of the piano. And yes, I had to sing an impossible buffle part, which took me forever to learn as well, because there's all this keep super high G's that were out of my range, try to not shout them, relaxing, Alexander technique or whatnot. And uh, I filmed it, I did it, I sent it to him. And, uh, and I think for a while I didn't hear back from him. I think it was the kind of thing where like, you know, he's a super busy man traveling the world. And uh, sometimes it might be six weeks, eight weeks before the email comes back. And in the meantime, there's all the range of human emotions. Like he hated it. He thinks I'm horrible. He wants me to die. He'll never answer back to me. I made a fool of myself. How did I dare to do that? And, and then I think I met him. Lawyers I... looking for you. Exactly. <laughs> and then I think I met him back. Uh, 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 his, uh, his tour manager gave me tickets to go see Marumbrio Jazz when he was playing with the quartet that I would have joined later. And uh, uh, I would... They did... <laughs> <laughs> this is Italy, but I understand it. But uh, Pat, the uh, manager, was like, come backstage afterwards so you can hang with Pat and say hello. And so they did the arena. I don't remember what it's called. The Santa Fugia. Giuliana. Santa Giuliana. Uh, the, the show. And then after I went backstage and there were two, two Italian guys at the door and they were like hey i'm like just meeting with pat i'm like a friend it's like yeah sure you're, ha, ha, you're of course and they didn't let me in and there was no way to get in yeah 
And then I met him later on. I walked back to the hotel where everybody, uh, Marque or something like uh, the hotel at the end of the the, the, yeah. the, the Grand Hotel where everybody stays. Yeah. This that that can that that the Umbri just likes. And uh, and I met him getting out of the the, the van. And I think he said something again. I sent your first logo to everyone. Everybody loves it. <laughs> and I, to my brain, it's like imagine who everyone is when Pat says everyone. <laughs> it's not like my cousin and. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, but yeah, so and, and and it was and I made a conscious choice to try to do a very different solo too with the piano because it seemed like unfathomable to even begin to scratch the surface and try to do any type of justice or any. I mean, I just didn't even know how to for, manage like emotionally the idea of trying to copy yeah. what Lyle was doing. Yeah, of course. But so I tried to go in a different direction and a little more abstract, maybe. Uh, but yeah. So, if you do any other sort of transcription, uh, which doesn't require ten hours every day <laughs> to to play a bar, um, how do you practice it? Like, how do you? Uh, get into I'm it. very conservative. It's like slow one bar at a time normally for mm. me. Like I, I, I just I like divide and divide and conquer and, and and start slow and try to speed it up. Like at the end of the day, that seems to be the um and also I remember this I got from my from my second piano teacher, uh, Rosana Bottai, it was like this fantastical G that maybe the only real uh, met methodic teacher I've had, the one that got me through all the exams of the conservatory. And uh, she was this wonderful sort of grandma figure, but she also had won the Geneva Prize and she was like a prodigy during the war and had a duet uh, with uh, with Arturo Benetti Michelangeli. And so she, but then became but a housewife later on because she was a woman in Italy in the 1950s and whatnot. But uh, she kind of taught me that anything you ever study has a 10% of things that are worth studying and the rest is, is fluff that you can do with your eyes closed. And so it's no point every time repeating the whole thing to then arrive to the difficult part, uh, to then go through it once then go back to the top and waste all the time. To the thing. And she would just always have this like, you know, everything, whether it was like a Bach prelude or like a Chopin ballad, uh, there'd be something like, okay, this four bars you have to do 60 times every day when you wake up. This four times. And then, and I would have this like little diary of 20 parts. And like those you have to do 60 times a day. The rest, eh, you'll figure it out. The rest is fine. Yeah. Like this you have to constantly do. And so in that sense, if there's a, if I was doing a, a mic breaker thing and there's like a thing that is like very far away from, from what I can do, that that has to be really the only thing that I'm like paying attention to until I can master that. There's no point in me even trying to like, and because I'm a multi-instrumentalist and I'm not a virtuoso on instruments and I, I, I have more technique on the piano. So maybe the piano, I can more directly hear a thing. It's like, oh yeah, it's that thing, fine. I don't need to study it too much. But if I hear a trumpet, a saxophone, a vocal or a vibraphone part or something that it's hard or a drum part or a bass, any of the other instrument there's got there's got to be a thing where like that's out of my comfort zone like that thing i can't i wouldn't just improvise that that i have to study and figure out how to relax my body to hit that thing because it's alien to my brain yeah and, it, and, and the funny thing is that it will go back to being alien uh a week after i i have uh I have learned it exactly, maybe not a week, but a month after. Like when I do very difficult videos or I try to replicate difficult things with instruments that are not my first instrument, uh, you know, because it isn't my first instrument, I have to constantly, like if I, when I was touring with Gad and, and Will Lee and we were doing Breaker Brothers tunes, I, it, it, I would constantly have for the month leading to like every day, hammer those things down to like, bleeding because otherwise my body would have retained like th that level of difficulty and uh, 20 days after the the gig is over and i'm back in brooklyn or back in los angeles uh, i 
I can't do it to this. I would have to go back and like, and I think this is, this is true of like a lot of musicians. I mean, Pat, when I went to Pat uh, on the, when we did, uh, when we jammed the first time we're doing, we did first circle in unison together, two guitars. And he doesn't remember like exactly like everything. Cause it's like a really difficult part. And he hasn't played it probably since the last tour. So like, yeah. I assume, I don't know much about other musicians brains, but I assume it's like, decently normal to like not always be on top shape to be able to do every single thing you've ever done. Yeah. I remember it happened to me with Stefano Bollani, another Stefano, uh, that a few years ago when we could travel, I went back to Italy and Stefano invited me to play at one of his concerts as a guest. And I just started playing a tune of his that we played probably 15 years back. And not only he was surprised, but he told me after the concert that he thought it was like a, like something, you know, bad that I did him. Yes, he, he said, why you, you started the piece? Yes, I, I couldn't remember it. But then I said, yeah, but eventually you did because those things that it's true that you might not be able to recollect on the spot but then it's a it's a place that you have spent so much time on it that is not too hard to but like subconscious but not too far yeah to receive it's like if you go back to the same place where you grew up you know you know all the streets, you know how to go from here to there. And if there's a traffic jam, you still remember what is the side way to get to where you have to go. Because, you know, you spend so much time in, in right. that thing. So to, to me, it's a little bit the same. There, there are some solos that I never play. But sometimes, occasionally, if I have to demonstrate you know, how to transcribe and what you can achieve to transcribe, I occasionally say, okay, let me show you something. And I try to play a solo that I might have transcribed 10 years ago, and I might miss, yeah, a couple of bars, but 90% of it is still there. I just have to, you know, open the file and, and recollect it, load it. Uh, so... I think that has something to do with how our mind works because the the ears and the listening is probably our deepest sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have memory. Yes, we, we do have memory of um, smells, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but the easiest example to understand that I can make is that I lost, unfortunately, both my parents. Uh, but if I think of my mom, which died in 2006, so 15 years ago, I can hear her voice right. in my head. So that's a memory that will always be with me. I can hear her voice calling me. Uh, you know? right. And... And that's that's really deep. It's connected to to who you are. It's connected into your soul. So when we transcribe, we try to connect our soul with that music, with that sound. Is is never the notes themselves. Right. You know, there is so much more. And this is probably one of the reasons why I decided to do this um, podcast. Is in these times where everything is so visual there is a real danger that we are all exposed to. You know, it, young students, they, they look at my hands and I hate it. You know, when I play, sometimes I, I give them examples and I do this. <laughs> right? Because I, I say, guys, there's no point. There's no point in using your eyes. You have two amazing things here and you are not using them. It's it's a big waste. You know, so to me it's very clear that music 
it, it's here mainly. And I, with this podcast, I, I just genuinely try to encourage people to trust their ears a lot more but you know now you it's want almost to... like a matter of absorption like transcription conjures the writing the scripture the it's almost like in a way it's 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 a matter of the really like absorb interior like making your something it could, it could be again it could be the way that that a electric bass is played or it could be the 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 the, the three ways of making the d on the saxophone or it could be a phrase but it, it isn't it isn't just the exercise of trying to put with the pen on a paper the value notes of what you're listening that is uh as you know it's like that 15 percent of what is going on and then there's all these other things yeah. uh, that really are are more uh and and try and 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 i guess the the exercise of trying with your own body to redo that to learn to it to to memorize the feeling of making that sound in a way because until you try it it's hard to really understand what that sound is yeah uh, when you absolutely and, and i guess the, 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 my desire sometimes to have done all these covers and and and, and learning instruments is a i guess some sort of subconscious way of try to enter within the songs that i love like yeah. oh my god what is uh how does he do that? How? Why is that thing sounding that way? And and he, until I do it, it's it's it doesn't. It, 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 I, I, can't, I don't know. I remember when I was young, two hundred years ago. Um, I just transcribed this thing. Uh, I don't know if I can play anymore. I think so. Which is the beautiful introduction to Overjoyed by Stevie Wonder. Uh -huh. You know, and it took me, I don't know, a month to understand <laughs> what was going on. And it's a you know, once you know it, you say, Oh yeah, sure, it's very simple, you know. Right? right? How it's sensitive. Yeah. But the fact that it's played like in the low octave. Right. And the fact that Uh, it, it's not, you know, despite being almost a pop song, it's not uh, too simple. Um, brought me a sense of joy. It's, it's like, you know, when, I don't know, uh, the first man on, on, on the Everest. Um, right. It's really magic. It's like learning a trick. You know, like, in a way, it's yeah, like you've yeah. seen something that you like, it doesn't seem possible that you can make a person float, and then you realize how you make a person float. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm passionate about chess. That's my, my second uh -huh. passion. And it's like when you learn a new trap, you know, right, right. and of course, all the traps need the collaboration of, of the opponent. But when it works, it's like being a baby. It's like, oh, you know, and it is, it's exactly that. I, I can look into, you know, inside that thing. I can see the, the, the toy from the inside. Oh, and it, it's the magic I mean, trick like, reveal. You know, you can, you, can, you can extend that to literally every area of life like the first time you make uh, whipped cream and you're like oh my god if i take cream and then i add uh, oxygen inside the cream it builds and now it has this amazing consistency you make meringue or like yeah. any chemical reaction or uh, you learn how to build something with wood and you make a couple of things and then this thing is a thing made of wood that you made i make my own guitars and uh, and and basses and and drums and like uh, and just like oh Oh, the edge of the drum and then I can make this and then if I change that if I round it up a little bit it's warmer sounding but then I can change this and that I mean it's it, it goes it boils down to it like if you're curious everything from 
relationship to other people, relationship uh, to women or men, relationships to uh to the chemicals of like food and uh, the <laughs> music and i mean everything is this feel where like oh my god how do they do that yeah so uh i think our time is up uh as i told you before julio uh has been a real pleasure before we go i uh have one more duty and it's one question, which is the dumb question. So we have been talking about, you know, heights of music um, and some music royalties too. So I have to ask this question to bring the level <laughs> to a more, you know, mortal level. Uh, and the question is, what is your favorite solo that you have transcribed and why? I know. I know the answer is, oh, it's impossible to, to nominate one. But, you know, this is the game. And you have to say one. I, I will have to say that... <laughs> I hate those questions when Jordan is saying, well, who, who's your favorite you know saxophone the, the player? The mood of the day changes and your favorite song changes so that you have like a 20 yeah. packages. Uh, maybe I, I will say that still my... Uh, but I would have to remember the title of that song. My, my dearest memory is still that Petrucciani first song that I transcribed because you can, it's like the first time you make love or the first kiss. Like you can never replace the stupor, the the awe of opening the Pandora's box the first time and realizing that this thing that was completely inaccessible and impossible, all of a sudden, like when at age thirteen I sat down and I replayed this Petrucciani piece from start to end and it sounded to my optimistic ears like the same thing uh it's hard to ever replicate the first time that that happens yeah i could go through like a lot of like solos that are maybe more beautiful or even songs that are more of an impact musically on me but emotionally i don't know that there's ever been a thing the first time that i realized those minor chords with the nines and the clusters and 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 I was, and immediately I like, I had to do it in every key, and I had to play that voicing for like twelve hours all yeah. day, every day. And you overdo it. And you overdo it for three months. And then yeah, you use it at every <laughs> jam session yeah. in every standard for until I'm twenty. <laughs> until nobody wants to play with you anymore. <laughs> until you are day intoxicated. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, I, I think, uh, and I will do though, like a, a mention of honor to that to that Garberg solo on Prism. Uh, yeah. Uh, on personal monster, just because I know it's really hard to find uh, that thing. In I mean, there, you know, there's millions of records, but that that solo, that moment on that song, uh, the, who knows? It it just it it just. It doesn't happen often that you would rather listen to how beautiful the solo is than the theme. And that the solo seems the theme and the theme seems like the intro to the, to the theme that is the solo. And when, and when, and when Garbrecht starts doing that, and Garbrecht honestly does it on a lot of tracks, but on that one, that's just like the wind. It's like when the the il, the capo direttore siderale di Fantozzi. Cioè, yeah. There's this thing like the vision of the the Holy Mary when when yeah. when he when he does that, and the reverb and the the song is beautiful. But it just I don't know that that can be taught. I <laughs> mean, the the whole recording of Personal Mountains is in my probably top five list. Uh, th it's, there it's, was it's, one of those periods where I used to listen to that recording every day, every single day, and I was there's touring. Everything. There's like a, there's there's like all the there's like a little blues. There's like a ballad. Uh, there's like the free. But thing. even the first track, I mean, the first track is something that is to me is still un ununderstandable. How can a band play with that energy 
for like right. 15 minutes and, and not be boring <laughs> and not be boring and then they reach the end and they play this long coda which is you know the calm after the storm and it's like i have died you know this right. is this is where i want to be once the whole i die spectrum of human yeah. yeah this is where i want to be once once i'm gone i want to be here because it's so peaceful that you know this must be a good place to be for eternity <laughs> imagine having seen them during that tour having seen like six yeah. seven shows like and we are very lucky because as you know that that recording was published only like 12 years uh, after the it's tour it's true it was never released in vinyl yeah. yeah anyway look time is cruel but um uh we need to go and thanks so much julio has been a real pleasure and brought me some good good and nice memories to talk to you today and we'll definitely keep in touch and i'll put all the links that you would like to share with our audience in the podcast description so if you have a website or anything that you want to share with our audience will be there in the description so thanks again a lot and goodbye to everyone talk soon Thank you.